Let me put it this way, I, I, like, I like to think that God is real. I don't believe in God because the idea that an omniscient, loving being would judge me who is mortal and ignorant based on a few years' experience, I find to be rather a cruel thought. All the power that God has, he, she, it has given to me. So we're definitely one. Uh, I hope, I hope there's, there's something else out there. It'd be, it'd be fun to experience. Either that or we're all just evolved apes. Um, I was raised atheist. I don't believe in a higher power, but I also don't claim to know everything about the world. I don't know. I don't know if there is one. I just pretend, I guess, and hope that there's something else out there. Well, again, welcome back uh, to Explore God. If you're new with us, just a reminder, this, this series that we're in, uh, entitled Explore God, is taking place over the course of 800 plus churches throughout the Chicagoland area. So we're just one of many groups of people exploring this very big question this morning. In fact, these, over these seven weeks, we're exploring these seven big questions of life and of faith and of who God is and how we relate to it. And our goal is really to start a conversation. Um, and in fact, the majority of the conversation happens outside these walls. It happens around our kitchen tables and, and our workplaces and coffee shops and, and all the like, just, just around us in the place that God puts us and the people that he puts us there with. So for our time together this morning, my, my goal is really to take these these overarching, really significant, really big questions and to attempt in, in a very concise way to drive at the heart of the matter from a biblical worldview. So that, that's what I hope to speak into or offer as it relates to these questions over the course of these seven weeks. With that being said, I, I want to return just briefly to where we left, uh, left off last week with that question of does life have a purpose? Um, because I had someone ask me following that, they said, why did you start there? Why did you start with, does life have a purpose? Particularly in light of the second question, is there a God? Wouldn't that be necessary to establish in advance of, of the question of purpose? And, and I think that's a fair question. Um, and I can't speak for those organizers of Explore God and why they chose, what order they chose, and that sort of thing. But from experience... I would say that oftentimes it is the question of purpose and the pursuit of purpose that leads us to the consideration and contemplation of who God is and his existence. So if, if you think about it, it's, oh, what do I experience first? What leads me there? Oftentimes what's unsettled in us is this question of purpose, which then sort of forces us to ask the second question about, about who God is. So this, this, process that we're on these questions, it's, it's, it's a journey of a bit. Um, and there is an accumulation to what we're talking about. And to that point, if you did miss last week, if you weren't here, let me encourage you to go back, whether it's on the, the Chapel Street Church app or on our YouTube page and watch that, because I do think it is um, helpful as it relates to what we're going to be talking about today. In fact, if you miss any of these over the next seven weeks, let me encourage you to go back and watch them. So with that said, let's, let's jump into this second question. Is there a God? Now, you might not, you're probably guessing that from the perspective of the pastor of a Christian church, that I am operating from the position and the perspective that there is, in fact, a God, and that I believe him to be the God of the Bible. I, I recognize that. It's not as if I am an unbiased voice in this matter, not that that exists. I, in fact, was raised in a home and in a church that held to, taught me 
the existence, the truth, the fundamental truth of life was the reality of God. So that, that was weaved into the fabric of, of who I am, my understanding of reality, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one like here, but I think it's important to understand when you talk about these matters, where somebody's coming from, what their background and history is. However, being raised in a Christian home, being raised with the belief that there is a God, and, and that being a good thing, that being my default setting, I, like so many who are raised in that environment, have to come to a point in time in my life, a place in my life where I choose what I believe because it's what I believe, or what I believe because it's what my parents and my church taught me when I was a kid. Like, I, I, I have to make my faith my own determine it for myself. In fact, much of that process happened for me as a college student when I was at a Bible school studying to, to go into ministry when I really began to wrestle in earnest with some of these essential questions. Like if you ever wanna throw your dorm floor into a tizzy at a Bible college, like go into the lounge and start being like, guys, what if, what if this has all been a facade? Like, what if we've bought into the wrong thing? Like, that just, everybody's mind explodes simultaneously at that point, right? Now, I will add to that, that, that I felt like the process for me was, I felt like I had the advantage being raised in a home that taught me this. I had the advantage in history and background where I believed I had experienced, and I'm talking personal now, experienced God in very real ways. And so the question for me I think morphed rather quickly from, do I believe that there is a God, to the question of why do I believe there is a God? See, Frederick Buechner uh, words it this way when he's talking about processing doubt. He says, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you're kidding yourself or asleep. He says, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. It keeps it awake and moving. I think that's right. I think Buechner words that well, that, and his point to this question, is there a God, really is what moved me to the question of why do I believe that there is? And secondly, how would I then articulate that, or I would, would um, um, be able to demonstrate that in conversations with friends and families and neighbors who are asking the same question? I would imagine, I would argue that all of us wrestle with this question at one point in time or another. And no matter what conclusion we've come to, whether we believe that there is in fact a God or that there is not, we, we, we continue to discover or wrestle with or even doubt at times the experience of that. So what's interesting for me about this particular question is that more often than not, it gets, it gets discussed and debated in, in sort of the realm or the arena of the intellectual, right? We, 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 we talk about this in terms of science and of, of theology and terms of philosophy, theories of existence, and all of that is good, and we're going to refer to some of that this morning. But, but in my experience as a pastor, in my own personal experience, I think that the question gets asked far more often in the realm of the experiential. In, in moments where we are trying to make sense of what's taking place in our lives and what's taking place around us, and sometimes the reconciliation between those two things, the idea of, of what I'm seeing, what's happening, and the belief that there is a God, and particularly the belief that this God of the Bible that I've heard about who's supposed to love me and who's supposed to be sovereign all, over all these things, that those two things together are irreconcilable. Oftentimes we're, we're left asking that question, so is he out there? And if he is, does he care? And really I think what ultimately this kind of is a commercial for next week. I think sometimes we're actually asking next week's question, which is why does God allow pain and suffering? We'll get to that later. We'll get to that next week. Maybe that's why some of you are here. Whether you, whether you believe in God or not, I want to invite you into this question this morning. Is there a God? Or what, what I'll really be getting after is, is why I believe there is. Why I believe there is. That being said, I, again, I want to just offer a couple thoughts here at the outset. 
First, I would like to caution all of us against the idea that, that those of us with a strong intellect, that the really smart people land on one side of this discussion or another. I've seen this played out in various ways, and that's just simply not true. You, you could find atheists, or you could find deeply committed followers of Jesus in the realm of science, in the realm of, of the arts, in the realm of um, philosophy and theology and all of that, who have come to very different conclusions. So, so I, think, I, I think it's unproductive to the conversation overall. So we have to be careful not to sort of assume things about people or even about the question. And the second point I want to make is that this is, this is not a conversation about proof. If I could empirically prove to you this morning the existence of God, I would be happy to do so. But what we talk about in terms of our belief in God is a faith. In fact, what we talk about with the agnostic or the atheist talks about in terms of their disbelief or unbelief in a God is also a statement of faith. What we're, what we're considering this morning is a question of evidence. And that I would like to, to at least submit to you the, the, uh, the thesis that, that there is a God who exists, that the evidence points to that, and that it's in fact more reasonable to believe that than it is to believe that he doesn't exist. And then thirdly, I would just like to say that the, Bi the Bible does not, um, I want to word this correctly, does it, it's not offering us an apologetic for the existence of God. By that I mean it, it assumes it. it, it the, very fir the four first words in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, is in the beginning God, right? It, it's not trying to go through all of the arguments for the existence of God. It operates out of the existence of God. And so that being said, it, it, it's not like we're turning to a passage, and even if we did, right? If I, if I were standing up here and I'm or I'm an atheist, I would be thinking that's just circular reasoning. You're using what you believe God delivered to say God exists. But the Bible does, I think, offer a framework from time to time for our understanding of the evidence of why God does exist. And that's what I would like us to examine together this morning. One of the places that I think we see this most clearly is from the Apostle Paul. He writes a letter to this church in Rome, and this is what he says, and this is Romans 1, verse 20. He says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So uh, essentially, Paul is, is reminding or, or saying to the church in Rome, look around you. The evidence for God is all around you. And furthermore, Paul reminds him, he's saying, you then are responsible for that evidence. So moving forward, I, I, this morning I want us to consider the evidence from creation, the evidence of morality, and the evidence of hope. And again, please forgive the fact that this is, this is a drop in the bucket of a much, much larger conversation. But I want to use an ancient psalm written by King David as, as a framework for processing this. So this is Psalm 19. And let's begin by considering the evidence of creation. David writes this. He says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So, so David is, again, this is not an apologetic. He's, he's not, this is actually a response of worship or praise. And so the question is, what is e evoking this in David? What is causing him to, to respond this way? And he's saying, I am looking at creation, and all around me I see the revealed nature of the creator. So he is, he is essentially moved to worship by beauty and design. And we could spend hours on this point alone, but I, I want to just highlight a couple of quick thoughts here. The first idea that I think this points us to is simply the question, why is there something instead of nothing? Why is there something instead of nothing? 
the point that David, I think, at least evokes for us is, is existence. What, what, what do we assume the natural results of nothing be? If matter is, is floating around in space, if that's all there is, then even that would be an assumption that would have to be put in. Right? What, what do we resume the results of that to be if not, if not acted on? And, and vice, conversely, if we believe that there is a creator God, then what do we assume the results of that to be? Last week, I, I used the illustration of talking about my daughters and their Legos and how my little one likes to make different things and then tell me what it does and how, how creator gets to determine purpose, right, was, was the point of what I was saying. But if we use that same sort of thought, and if I were to go out and buy my kids one of those elaborate Lego things, I mean, there's amazing ones now. You can build the whole, like, Cinderella's castle, or, like, um, the Millennium Falcon. There's this really cool one now that's, like, thousands of pieces. And if I were to buy that for my kids, and I put it in their room, and I came in the next morning, and it was completely assembled there all together, what is the natural conclusion of that event taking place? that someone did this, that, that, that someone acted on those pieces, they put them together in order to assemble, to put together a created thing, that it was the result of someone's activity. We would, of course, never assume that that just happened by uh, chance. We would never assume that the wind blew through an open window and the Millennium Falcon was all of a sudden there on the floor together in perfect form. And I understand that this is, is, is a, just a microcosm of the larger discussion, but the point is that every physical thing owns its existence to something. When we completely remove God from the equation and we seek to make matter or, or the physical world solely responsible for all that we see around us, we were left with these irreducible questions of how and what and where. We're left with the question, where did it all come from? How, how did random particles collide together in the infancy of space and create life? And, and however we answer, and I, I, there are certainly theories out there about that. Again, this is a consideration of evidence. But however we divide up physical reality, however we reduce it and section it up, those result. The results remain that we are left with a state of affairs that owes its existence to something else. C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist and, and later in life became convinced of, of the reality of God, says it this way. He says, an egg which came from no bird is no more natural than a bird which has existed from all eternity. An egg that came from no bird is no more natural than a bird that has existed for all eternity. In, in short, he's saying both of these are faith propositions. They're assumptions, and it's, his point is that he can more easily reconcile the existence of God based on the evidence than he can that it's a, a random act of, of chaos, that we've gotten this lucky. John uh, Polkinghorne, who is a uh, quantum physicist, he, he, he talks about the accuracy, the pinpoint accuracy that would be needed for all the circumstances to come together in, in perfect form. This is what he writes. He says, in the early picoseconds of the universe, so a, a, a picosecond, if I'm getting this right, is the time that it takes the speed of light to travel the width of a human hair. So a very short amount of time, I guess, would be a, a better way to say that. In the early picoseconds of the universe, the necessary contingencies for the expression for the expansion had to be so exact and the margin of error in the necessary preconditions so small that it would be like taking aim at a one-inch target from 100 billion light years away and hitting it dead center. His point, in other words, is that his, in his estimation, it isn't reasonable. It, it, it's not the, the, it, it's more reasonable to conclude that this is the act of a divine being than it is of sheer chance. Um, one more quick illustration I've got. I, I, this is a stained glass window, a rose window on the left, right? We would look at that and we would, again, much like the Lego illustration, we would conclude that this is the result of someone's creative activity. 
that this didn't just show up randomly and, and create this beautiful thing. What's next to it is a human strand of DNA. It, it, it is marked by beauty and order and it contains um, an infinite amount of information that is placed in there that defines who someone is and what it is. Like, again, I understand that this, people would debate this. But when I look at that picture and I see that, that very base element of what makes up humanity and you see the beauty and the design behind it, the conclusion that I come to is someone, someone is out there who did this. And, and for me, that's part of the reason why I believe it's, it's not only a deity or a God, but it's the God of the Bible and it reflects his created order. Which brings us to the, the second thing that I want to highlight here is that it's not just the, the reality of existence, but it is also that they, we see de design and beauty in this, this finely tuned world around us. David says, the heavens declare, the, the, the skies proclaim. Verse 2, day after day they pour forth speech and night after night they reveal knowledge. Essentially, David is, is commenting or marketing on the the design and order that he sees in the created world around him. I don't know if you've seen those um, AT&T commercials that are out right now where it says, um, just okay is not okay. Has anybody seen those? They're actually pretty clever. But one of them is like there's a guy getting ready for surgery and he asks the nurse about his doctor and the nurse's response is, well, he's okay. And the guy's like, he's just okay, you know? And the doctor walks into the room and, and says, hey, are, are you nervous? And the guy's like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, I am too, you know. <laughs> and, and when it comes to not only our existence, but the sustainment of our existence, being close is not close enough. Like just okay is, is, is not okay. We live in this finely tuned world. In order for the universe to sustain life, in order for this planet to be a place where people can live, anything can live. The, the creation had to be so specific and so ordered, and this is what David is getting at. It's, it's revealing the knowledge of God. Astrophysicist Hugh Ross talks about this as, as the cosmological constants, meaning the elements that had to be in place not only for there to be life, really any sort of life, but for life to continue are so specific and so finely tuned that it would be more reasonable, he suggests, to suppose a tornado hitting a, a junkyard and forming a, a fully assembled operational Boeing 747. <coughs> His conclusion is that it's not mathematically, it's not, it's not scientifically reasonable to, to imagine the fine tuning. Like just imagine, for instance, one element of gravity. If, if gravity were just a few degrees heavier, life would be unsustainable on Earth. And if it were a few degrees lighter, it wouldn't exist. Like that's just one thing that's so specifically, so finely tuned in order to preserve it. And so like David, Hugh Ross is assuming there's, there's evidence throughout creation. Secondly, then let's consider the evidence of morality. The evidence of morality back in, in Psalm. This is Psalm, we're going to jump down to verse 7 now. David continues. And he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart, and the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever, and the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold, and they're sweeter than honey, any honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. So David, as he continues, he, he essentially is saying, I'm not just moved to this place of worship by the form and the function that I see in the created world and how that reflects its creator, but I'm moved by the governance of this world, by, by this, this moral code that, that seems to be universal and ingrained in each of us. What C.S. Lewis refers to as the ought. Right? And the abolition of man. That we have this sense that we ought to do something. Or this sense that I ought not to do something. 
He's asking the question, where does this come from? Where does our sense as humanity of justice and human rights come from if it's not from outside of ourselves? Bertrand Russell, who is a philosopher and an atheist, is, he's talking about this, and this is what he says. He says, I cannot live as though ethical values are purely a matter of personal preferences. And he says, and I don't know a solution to this. So he's essentially saying if, if matter, if the physical world is all there is, then our sense of moral obligation that governs how we live and how we interact with each other, I have no answer for that. In fact, um, Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion and one of the faces of the New Atheist Movement, um, he, he's been and speaks and debates different Christian philosophers and theologians. When pushed on this topic, he said that that you have to, if you are a truly an atheist in a materialistic worldview, you must be willing to deny the existence of objective evil. See, see, so for him, he's saying if, if that's your worldview, your, your viewpoint, you have to be able to deny entirely the existence that anything is truly objectively evil. And of course, it's, it's, it's that very worldview, that very belief that has informed some of the most horrific genocides in, in human history. And, and again, somebody from the other side would easily point to instances where people have done horrible things in, in God's name. But I will point to that particular worldview and some of the most horrific events in, in human history, and it's been present in belief. When our morality is strictly the product of who holds power and position in a culture, then it, it can devolve down to what truly what is survival of the fittest. And we look at that, when we see that in the world, we almost universally look around it and say, this isn't good. That's, that's not right. We live right now in a culture of outrage, right? If you go on Twitter, we, we just see people upset about everything. But what gives us the right to be upset about it? Like there's things in our world that we look at and we say, that's not how it's supposed to be. Somebody gave me a box of Graham's chocolates, and I brought those home as a gift, and I put them in a cupboard, right? And a couple days later, I went back to that cupboard, and those Graham's chocolates were almost all gone. Like, we can universally say that's not right, you know? <laughs> like, that that's not just. Where does that come from in us? Where, where is that reside in us? I think we know it when we see it because it's a reflection of God's hardwired design inside of us. And David writes that laws of the Lord are perfect. They're created by him to govern his creation. This is not proof for the existence of God. But morality, human rights to me, I believe, are evidence for the existence. And without God, it's difficult to explain. And lastly, real quickly, let's look at the evidence of hope. The evidence of hope. David concludes his, his psalm in, in Psalm 19 with these words. This is verse 12 to the end of the chapter. He says, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sin that they may not rule over me. And then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression." May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. See, at the conclusion of this psalm, after reflecting on and, and marveling at this perfect law, after reflecting and marveling at this, this created order that David sees around him, he offers this expression of hope. He refers to God as his rock and his redeemer. See, for David, to refer to God as his redeemer is to acknowledge his need for redemption. It, it is a hope for a solution to his most fundamental need, to his most fundamental problem, what in, the, in terms of theology we refer to as the problem of sin or, or living out of alignment with our creator. We, we intrinsically hope, and without it, life quickly becomes depressed and our sense of meaning dissipates. I read an article this week entitled, Life Without God is Weird. And in it, Gary Ortland says this, he says, hope is essential to human life, and hopelessness is unlivable. It's a curious thing, then, that a world ultimately devoid of hope should produce creatures 
who cannot function without it. See, I think, I think this issue, this topic here, this evidence, I think this is really critical because when we talk about creation and when we talk about uh, the evidence of morality, that, that could ultimately lead us to, to a deist or even an agnostic point of view, worldview, that God has set all this into motion, but now he is disinterested and uninvolved. But I think when we see this in the context and the evidence of hope, what I find most compelling about this is that this requires a belief in a knowable God who has designed us for relationship with him. Oftentimes when, when I'm having a conversation with somebody on these very topics, and friends and neighbors and that sort of thing, particularly when they grew up like I did, they grew up with a system of belief and they've come to a place in their life where they can no longer believe. Oftentimes they'll say to me things like, I, I can't believe in a God who, and they go on to describe some impersonal, distant God or, or, or even a, a cruel God. And my answer is oftentimes the, is, is always the same. Is that I don't, I don't believe in that God either. That's not the God that I believe in. I believe in the God who is on display in space and time and history. I believe in the God who spoke the universe into existence and who sustains it with care and beauty. I, I believe in the God who made man in his own image and who cares about each and every individual life from the time it is in the womb to the time it's in the grave. I believe in the God who calls people out of darkness and into light. I believe in a God who delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt, and I believe in the God who is calling and delivering people to this day. I believe in a God who does not stand at a distance, but who entered his created world by sending his son, Jesus Christ. I believe in a God who is just, and who would ultimately satisfy his justice by sending his son to die on a cross to redeem those who trust him. And I believe that the same God raised him back to life ultimately conquering death and hell. I believe in a God who knows you, and a God who calls you to know him. And I believe that this is, is the God of hope. I believe that this is the God who desires to know you personally because he cares about you and he loves you. So no matter where you're at on this spectrum this morning, whether you're in a place where you're looking at this question and you're saying, I, I've come to the conclusion I don't believe, or you've been a person of faith your entire life, the invitation for each of us this, this morning is I would invite all of us to consider the evidence. And secondly, I would invite each of us to, to know him more, to, to, to at least seek to, to understand him and what he's done for us. And this is the evidence of, of what we see around us. He loves you. He, he is your rock and your redeemer. Would you pray with us and the worship team will come up and conclude us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to continue to look at these really relevant and really large questions. And God, I know that we're all coming to these questions from different places and different experiences. But I pray this morning, Lord, that in, in earnestness as we seek to understand and we seek you, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself, that you would make yourselves known. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day together and this chance to, to continue these conversations. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand with us?